Hello and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. And Jules, what did you pick for us this episode? Well, this week we're going to be talking about the Velvet Underground and Nico. So, Dad, what do we need to know about this album? Well, we need to know that I'm just going to cover the history of the band as opposed to doing a Lou Reed biography. However, if you want to learn more about Lou Reed, check out Lou Reed, A Life by Anthony DeCurtis. It came out in 2017. And I read it, and it's exhaustive and excellent. And as noted book reviewer Iggy Pop said, Lou Reed is Lou Reed. And that's that. Yep. Also, check out Please Kill Me, The Uncensored Oral History of Punk by Legs McNeil and Gillian McCain. It's shocking and hilarious. Okay, so it's 1964. Lou Reed has been working as a songwriter for budget label Pickwick Records. He meets Welshman John Cale, who came to the United States to study classical music after securing a Leonard Bernstein scholarship. Holy shit. Now, Cale had worked with experimental composers such as John Cage and Lamont Young, but what he really wanted to do was rock. <laughs> he and Reed bonded over the use of drones in music. The sound, not the little flyers. Those would come decades yeah, later. Yeah, years later. Anyway, their first group was the Primitives. They recruited Sterling Morrison to replace Walter DeMaria, who went on to become famous for his sculpture and installation art. Lou and Sterling played guitars, Cale played bass, keyboards, and viola, and Angus McLeese played drums. They were known as the Warlocks, then the Falling Spikes. Then in 1965, they became the Velvet Underground, which they took from the book of the same name by Michael Lee. Oh, I didn't know it was a book. Is yep, it any good? It, it, I haven't read it, but it was about the secret sexual subculture of the 1960s. Uh. Since Lou had just written Venus in Furs, it was a natural fit. Yeah. Also in 65, Reed, Cale, and Morrison recorded the demo, minus McLeese, because he did not want to be tied down to a schedule. He came and went as he pleased. When Cale briefly went back to Britain, he tried to pass on the demo to Marianne Faithful, hoping she would pass it on to Mick Jagger, but nothing came of it. Mm. Their manager, Al Aronowitz, got them their first paid gig at the Summit High School in New Jersey, but McLeese quit, saying they were selling out, man. Uh oh. And to Maureen Tucker, who was the sister of Sterling Morrison's friend, Jim Tucker. She played standing up, using mallets as much as drumsticks and eschewing cymbals. Her rhythms would go on to be a vital part of the group's music, even though Cale initially objected to a female drummer. Uh -huh. In 1965, filmmaker Barbara Rubin introduced the band to Andy Warhol, who became their manager. Mm -hmm. He suggested they use German-born singer Nico, a.k.a. Krista Pofkin, on some of their songs. Warhol's reputation got them signed to Verve Records. Mm -hmm. Yep, the same label as Astro Gilberto. Ah, so, let's, throw back to last, uh, last episode. So ruminate on that, listeners. Yeah. Andy then decided to become a producer, which in the way he was in the sense of being like a film producer, like he had the money yeah. to back the band and bring in the people that they needed and pretty much gave them free reign. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't behind the board twiddling the knobs and all that. Yeah. Reed and Kale said Tom Wilson, who got credit for producing the lead-off track Sunday morning, produced the whole album. Anyway, The Velvet Underground and Nico was recorded in 1966, but didn't get released till 67. And we'll mm. get into some more detail on that late, a little later. But I will tell you, the reason that they called the album The Velvet Underground and Nico was because the band said that she was not part of the band. And well, they felt yeah. that if they just called themselves the Velvet Underground... It'd be like, oh, gotta... here's a new member, yeah. but it's not. And they really weren't crazy about her because she kind of got foisted upon them by Andy. Yeah. But they figured, well, he's got the money. Let's see what we can do with this. Now, anyway. What are your opinions on Andy as an artist? Because I know a lot of people who hate him. And I know a lot of people who are like, wow, soup cans. He was just a great self-promoter. I mean, he mm. was the one who came up with... You know, everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes. And if he was alive today, I'm sure he would have changed it to everyone be famous for 15 seconds. Yeah. Anyway, the Velvet ended their relationship with Andy Warhol when Andy told Lou that he needed to think about the future. Did he really want to be playing museums and art festivals forever? And Lou thought about it and he thought, yeah, Andy, you're right. Oh, you're fired. <laughs> and Mike told me that Andy called Lou the worst name he could think of. What? Which was Lou... You're a rat. <laughs> For him, that was the ultimate insult. Because, oh, like, you're, you're filthy and dirty and carrying of disease. 
Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, they teach their own. So Andy was fired. Nico moved on, and she eventually had a solo career. And she also broke up with Lou Reed. They had a thing going. Really? And the way she broke up was saying that she could no longer sleep with Jews. Oh, uh... Does, and it does not get more German than that. Oh, Jesus yep. Christ. Oh, God. Anyway, the band recorded White Light, White Heat in September 67 with Tom Wilson once again producing. He had also produced uh, Bob Dylan. Anyway... It cl and Frank Zappa. Anyway, it climbed all the way up to 199 on the Billboard Top 200 Albums chart Ooh. <laughs> and stayed there for two whole weeks. Tensions were mounting between Reed and Kale. John was moving into a more experimental direction, and Lou was veering more towards pop. Really? Well, Lou's version of pop anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sterling Morrison and Maureen Tucker were caught in the middle. When Lou said either John Kale is out of the band or there's no more band, they reluctantly sided with Lou. Now, when the Velvets played the Boston Tea Party in the south end of Boston, it was John Cale's last show. The band hired Doug Yule at whose apartment they stayed. Sterling Morrison told Lou Reed that Doug was practicing guitar and improving. This led Reed, Morrison, and new manager Steve Sesnick having Doug meet them at Max's Kansas City Club in New York to discuss his joining the band. Yule was asked to handle bass and organ. After months of playing shows, the band recorded The Velvet Underground in 1968. It was released, released in March 69 and did not chart. It did mark a change in the band's sound, less abrasive, more tuneful. Mm. They spent most of 69 touring, and a live album was recorded, but not released till 1974. Mm. Mm. Anyway, Verve dropped The Velvets in 1969. New president Mike Kerb wanted to purge the label of any acts that glorified drugs. Apparently, someone forgot to tell Mike that it was the 1960s. Oops. Plus, any groups that weren't selling were on the chopping block as well. And the Velvets met both of those criteria. Oy. Also, fun fact, the animals were on that same label. Really? And so when Curb, you know, talked about his purge, Eric Bird said, hey, that's us. See ya. Oh, good. They left before they could get axed. Always a smart thing to do in business. Yep. Uh, the Velvets met both those criteria. Like I said, Cotillion Records, which was a subsidiary of Atlantic Records, signed the band. They called their fourth album Loaded in reference to Atlantic asking that it be loaded with hits. <laughs> Doug Yule sang lead on four songs, and it contains two of the band's best known, Sweet Jane and Rock and Roll. Both have gone on to become rock standards. Oh, I know Sweet Jane. A little bit. I haven't heard it in years. Yep. Maureen Tucker was pregnant at the time, but credit for drumming, even though the drums were played by Adrian Barber, Tommy Castanaro, and Doug Yule's brother Billy. During this time, the band, with Billy on drums, secured a nine-week residency at Max's Kansas City. Lou decided to quit during the last week of the band's stand. Now the band was Sterling Morrison, Maureen Tucker, Doug Yule, and Walter Powers on bass. They played periodic shows to promote Loaded. Sterling Morrison left in 1971 to pursue her PhD in medieval literature. Oh, wow, that's cool. He was replaced by Willie Alexander. This version of the band did some shows, but after a European tour, they disbanded. But then interest in the band renewed in Europe, and manager Steve Sesnick reached out to Yule to form some sort of version of the Velvets to tour. Let's An amalgamation. capitalize on the band's name. Yeah. But then Sesnick failed to show up with equipment and tour money. What? Dude, you are, what a shit manager. He, yeah, Lou just didn't like him anyway. I can see why. <clears throat> anyway, Doug and crew managed to play enough dates to get flights back to the U.S. And Doug was also in the not great position of recording what was essentially a solo album, but using the Velvet's name called Squeezed. It mm -hmm. got trashed then, but in recent years it's been reassessed as a not-too-bad curiosity. And it did give the New Wave British band its name. Mm, yeah, yeah. Since then, Lou Reed, John Cale, and Nico each had solo careers. Professor Sterling Morrison taught medieval lit at the University of Texas, Austin, became a tugboat captain and for, for several years, and played in Maureen Tucker's band because she had released a couple of albums in the 80s. What a fun life that guy's had. <laughs> no, seriously. Doug Yule played, played, actually played on a few of Lou Reed's solo albums because Lou... Really like Doug. Okay. Nico died of a cerebral hemorrhage oh, following shit. a bicycle accident in 1988. Always wear your helmet. Always wear your helmet. Always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she told her son 
Yeah, I gotta go down and uh, get some marijuana. I'll be back. She never came back. <laughs> Lou Reed and John Cale reunited in 1990 to make the album Songs for Drella, which was about Andy Warhol, who had died in 1987. This led to a reunion of the original four members. Sterling Morrison wanted Doug Yule to participate, but Lou and John overruled him. They toured Europe, but once again, Reed and Cale were at odds, and the band broke up again before even making it to the U.S. to tour. They had all these plans like, yeah, we'll start off in Europe and maybe we'll do the U.S. It's going to be great. And then, oh, yeah, I forgot how much you pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, well, you pissed me off, too. Isn't yeah. that always the way with some bands? Where it's like, hey, let's reunite. Oh, wait, I forgot why we broke up in the first place. Yeah, let's But some this. bands, you know, they have that tension and they need it. Mm. Anyway, Sterling Morrison died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1995. Oof. The band got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996. Mm. Doug Yule was not inducted. Uh -oh. And I think he should have been, because I think he wasn't included because he had the audacity not to be John Cale. Oh. And the thing is, like, Doug has participated in, like, like Velvet stuff. There was uh, some sort of discussion, I believe, at the New York Public Library, which involved him, Lou Reed, and uh, Maureen Tucker. And like, wow, that's oh, nice. That's, yeah, we showed up. Well, maybe it was John Cale because it was 2014. Anyway, my oh. memory's not what it used to be. Sorry, you can look it up. Anyway, Lou Reed suffered from hepatitis because always use clean needles, gang. Mm -hmm. Diabetes and eventually developed liver cancer. Holy shit. He died in 2013 and was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a solo artist in 2014. Costumes, okay. Now, as for the debut album, oh boy, Troublish. What? The subject matter alone was radical for the time. Drug abuse, prostitution, s and sexual deviancy. Mm. Now, Lou did not intend to write for shock value. His reasoning was, well, people are already reading about this stuff in literature. Why don't I write about it? Why not put a beat to it? Yeah. Now, Andy Warhol designed the cover. And when the album came out, you could actually peel the banana skin. What's under the banana? To find a uh, pinkish-hued banana underneath. Ah, oh, that kind of banana. Now, a special machine was needed to make the covers, which caused a delay in releasing the album. Oh, that's why. But Ver figured, hey, it's Andy Warhol. Everyone's gonna buy this. <laughs> now, also, on the back cover was an upside-down image of actor Eric Emerson, who at the time was strapped for cash, and so he wanted to pay, he paid for it, so he decided, I'll just sue the record company. Uh-oh. So Verve decided, hey, we'll just recall all the albums before they were distributed, to airbrush him out of the picture. Holy shit, that must have taken forever. Yep. Now, on top of all of that, when the album finally did come out, Verve had no idea how to promote it. And by that time that it did come out, it had to compete against Sgt. Pepper, mm -hmm. The Summer of Love, and other love, peace, and happiness bullshit. Jeez, no wonder it didn't do well. The album originally peaked at 171 on the Billboard 200 Albums charts, but it made a comeback and hit Number 129 in 2013 when Lou Reed died. Well, of course. That's what always happens. Yep. Now, the critics were mixed about this. It was either genius or it was noise. Now, since its original release, The Velvet Underground and Nico, and the three albums following it, are looked on as the greatest rock and roll albums ever made. Um, that's up, to, that's up for debate. Yeah. Now, of the first album, in 1982, Brian Eno said it only sold 30,000 copies, but everyone who bought one of those 30,000 copies started a band. Hmm. Now, as of 2013, it sold half a million copies total. And I'm sure that figure has risen since then. Oh, yeah. And anyone out there who knows what it is, please let us know. Yeah, tell us in the comments. Because I was doing research and research, but I got to a point where I thought, time to move on. Yeah. And lastly, it was inducted into the National Recording Registry of the Library of Congress in 2006. Huh. So, Ted Cruz, you can check out that album anytime you want. Just have it back in two weeks and no scratches, please. Yeah, and uh, don't get anything on the album once you listen to Venus and Furs. Uh, keep, keep, keep that between uh, you and God. Yeah. <laughs> now, as for me, yeah, I came late to this party. I figured, you know, better late than not at all. I mean, this is one of those bands I already heard of. And like I said, I knew Sweet Jane and Rock and Roll. Mm. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to jump in, do the full dive, borrowed all their albums from the library. And then according to Amazon... I bought all four albums on March 3rd, 2018, because I thought, I gotta have these. I gotta own these. Considering you're friends with Mike, I'm, I'm surprised you honestly didn't do it sooner. Well, the thing was, like, he really didn't fall into his Lou Reed Velvet's phase until, like, 
maybe a couple of years ago, he just oh, okay. fell into it and really got into them. I mean, he had some Alou solo stuff, but he never got around to like fully listening to them. And then once he did the deep dive, it's like, this is the greatest stuff ever. Mm -hmm. Now, my version of the Velvet Underground and Nico is the 1996 remaster, which restored the original um, album cover with just the banana, no name, no band name, but no title on it. It just says Andy Warhol in the bottom right corner. Can you peel the banana? You cannot peel a banana, but... Dang it, what? <laughs> there is a picture of the uh, pinkish color banana on the inside of the jewel box. So if you take oh, the CD... okay. So if you take the CD out... You'll have a, a banana. Yes. A banana. Yes. And that's what we're going to say. Yes, it's a banana. It is. It, no, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's just... get into the song, shall we? Yeah, okay. That don't have any bananas in them. Well, no. Right anyway. Okay, first track, Sunday morning. My first thought was, I wonder what this music sounds like when you're stoned. So I texted a friend who shall rename, remain nameless, and they said that they did it. Didn't say how it was, but they offered me a piece of advice. Don't listen to the Velvet Underground while on acid. Okay. <laughs> anyway, because the aura of, because, you know, I, I was I was thinking this, because the aura of the music with the echo, xylophone, and Lou Reed's voice with Nico's vocals in the background, it must sound even more far out under the influence. This song has the laziness of Sunday mornings, but for different reasons. For me, Sundays are when I turn into a potato and just veg, giving myself permission to do nothing. This laziness almost comes from giving up. Because now that the world has sort of stopped with people sleeping in and no work for the day, Lou feels the past creeping up to haunt him. Which I definitely think could happen if you just sit with yourself in a lazy manner and wonder, Gah, what is wrong with me? And the whole time we have this cheery xylophone representing everyone else going by happily, you know, eating their pancake breakfast, while Lou has the attitude of someone who woke up and grimaced when they saw the sun was out. Maybe just tune out the lyrics if you don't want an emotional wake-up call. Mm -hmm. Now this was the last song recorded for the album. Producer Tom Wilson asked for a song with lead vocals by Nico that could potentially be a hit single. Lou and John wrote it on a Sunday morning with Nico's voice in mind, but when it came time to record it, Lou sang it with Nico on background vocals. Since it was meant to be a hit, it's more poppy than the rest of the album. Yeah. And for me, it was totally unexpected. I mean, I finally get to hear the Velvets, and this is the song that kicks it off, which is not a complaint at all. I mean, it's a great song. I was pleasantly surprised, but wondered, where's the grit? And the thing is, the way Lou sings this, to me, it sounds like he's doing his impression of Nico, even though her voice is a little deeper. Yeah, it is. We'll get into that later, too. Next track, I'm Waiting for the Man. Oh, here's the grit. <laughs> Hearing the opening of this song, it makes sense that David Bowie and Lou Reed were friends, because the guitar lick is similar to the opening notes of Heroes. I don't know if you picked up on that. Oh, yeah, definitely yeah. influenced him. Now I want a Lou Reed cover of Heroes, if that exists somewhere in the void. Anyway, oh look, a drug deal! Lou is waiting for his man in Uptown New York, gets questioned as to why he's there, and he says, don't worry, I'm waiting for the man. He gets the stuff, takes it home, gets to fight with his girl, and says, relax, it'll be funny when I see the man again. Which will it, though? Most definitely not. I guess in terms of songs about Uptown, we have Roy Orbison on one end, and this is on the other. Whichever one you listen to, it depends on your mood. Up Uptown. That's true. Yep. Yeah. So Lou's in Harlem looking to score some heroin. He said the only thing that's changed about this song is the price. <laughs> and for me, there's, there's this hilarious vignette in which Lou is approached and asked, Hey, white boy, what are you doing down uptown? Hey, white boy, you chasing that woman around? And a nervous, respectful Lou replies, Oh, pardon me, sir. It's the furthest from my mind. I'm just looking for a dear, dear friend of mine. I'm waiting for my man. And you have to hear Lou's delivery to, re to really appreciate that moment. It, yep. It's just, it start, you can actually hear the, please don't beat me up, sir, yeah. tone in, in Lou's voice. Yeah. And as for the band, everyone except Lou is playing the same note at the same time, like hardly waving. It's just, dun, 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 mm -hmm. dun. And, but if you listen, you can hear Lou's just like all over with the guitar, but it works. And they keep it simple, but it's also catchy. And it's proof that you don't need a lot of noodling around and fancy smancy playing to deliver the goods. And I gotta say, I have actually heard this song play over the speakers at Whole Foods when I worked there. I'm impressed. And every time I heard it, it would just stop me in my tracks and I would just stand there and listen to the whole thing because I could not believe that this was playing in a grocery store. Was that in back a healthy in the, grocery store. Was that back in the day when um, it wasn't Whole Foods radio, people just put on Pandora and whatever they wanted? Um, 
Gee, that's a good question. Because that would make sense. Because I don't think Whole Foods Radio would allow that now. Um, I don't know. I could definitely see it being in uh, Shifty Carl's wheelhouse. Yeah, that's Carl. That sounds like him. Yep. Next track, Femme Fatale. Before I go any further, I'm going to give my analysis of Nico here. When I first heard her as a kid, I thought her voice was weird. And she kind of freaked me out. But now as a voice student, I realize, oh, she's not bad. She's a contralto. Now, in classical singing, this refers to a woman's singing voice, which is the lowest of a woman's voice type, and it's extremely rare. But there are a lot of famous ones, including Cher, Annie Lennox, Anita Baker, Tony Braxton, Tracy Chapman, and Patsy Cline. If you're not used to that type of voice, it can be jarring. You also have to remember that Nico is not a trained singer and English is not her first language. To be able to sing pretty decently in tune in English with a pretty decent lower range when this guy you know basically uses you as an ultimatum to make an album is impressive. As for the song, when I hear the words femme fatale, I think of film noir, adultery, gunshots, and death. But this femme fatale is unassuming, which is interesting. The only thing that lets this song down, in my opinion, is the backing vocals, because they're singing with the enthusiasm of a bunch of Catholics at Mass, only they can make Hallelujah not sound like Hallelujah. Eat it out of there, strung out. <laughs> so I'm like, come on, guys, moat. Uh, Lou wrote this song about uh, Warhol superstar Edie Sedgwick. Andy's superstars were a clique of New York personalities that he used for his art and for his movies. Mm. Nico sings lead, but she had some problems with pronouncing the title. She told Lou it's French and should be pronounced femme fatale. Lou's response was, he wrote it, and that's how he was going to pronounce it. Mm. So Nico is basically telling this guy that he has no chance with the femme fatale or the femme fatale, whichever. Mm -hmm. And she goes on to say that. He's number 37 in her book. So, you know, he's got like three th three dozen guys in front mm -hmm. just kind of waiting. So there's just no chance. It's time to acknowledge and move on. Mm -hmm. And as for Nico singing, well, for me, it's an acquired taste, I guess. I mean, yeah. I can appreciate what you just said because I can kind of see snippets in those other women that I you listed. mentioned. Because I thought... Yeah. Yeah, I can kind of see that, but they're more tuneful. But like you said, English was not her first language. Yeah. She's got a very thick accent. And I'm going to say it. Okay. If Natasha from Rocky and Bronicle sang, this is what she would sound like. The one Was she the one who worked for the Russians? With yeah. Side, sidekick to Boris Badenov. Oh, God. Yeah. The, the playing, for me, is like unexpectedly beautiful. Yeah, and it's fine. I think they were really trying in the background to sound... Tuneful. Like I mm -hmm. said, this is Lou Reed's version of pop, so yeah. that's what you're going to get. And it's kind of amateurish in a way, but it what, doesn't bother me. I don't want, no, the, the background the vocals. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I don't mind at all. I Like I said, I think the playing is like, it makes you sit up and like, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. Hmm. They really do. Yeah. Next track, Venus and Furs. Okay. You said you had something. Hit it. Lay on me. Oh, I'd pay big money to know how many people had an awakening when they first heard this song. Why? Well, if you Google BDSM playlists, almost everyone has this song on it. Why? Well, Venus and Furs is a novella by Leopold von Secher Mesach, which is very close to S&M, sadomasochism, right. even though the word sadism comes from the Marquis de Sade. The adaptation of the novel I know is the David Ives play, where a man is writing a stage adaptation of Maysoch's novel, and it starts with him on the phone complaining he can't find the right actress for Vonda. Suddenly, an actress bursts in and auditions. I can't say what happens during the audition because YouTube will flag this video for sexually explicit content and take it down, but a lot happens due to the actor, actress, and playwright uh, getting caught up in the roles they read. A professor of mine who shall remain nameless did this play at his theater company a few years ago, and I decided not to go because I knew... If he bumped into me, then the next time we saw each other would be uh, awkward. pretty friggin' awkward. Yeah. So to that, Professor, you're welcome. Yeah. With all that said, this is my favorite track on the album so far. In my opinion, BDSM is often portrayed unfairly and inaccurately in media. It is either depicted as abuse or that the people who practice are mentally disturbed. And when it comes to the internet, it's very easy to fall down the wrong rabbit hole when doing research. I think maybe the most healthiest depictions of this are... Uh, this song, it's more realistic, and the movie Secretary with uh, James Bader and Maggie Gyllenhaal. With this song, it tells the story of a dominatrix getting ready to tend to someone whose kink is whipping, which, cursed fun fact time, was the same kink preferred by a famous British author who wrote children's stories that were Christ allegories featuring a lion. 
I am not making this up. He wrote those in his letters that are on public record, and you can find direct quotations if you Google them. So welcome to My Dad Listens to This, where we ruin your childhood. But back to the song. Whether you're into the scene or not into the scene, the song is definitely intriguing and makes your hair stand on end. The atmosphere is dark, and Lou Reed is able to create as close to an out-of-body experience as you can get. And the electric viola is the perfect touch, creating the, the eeriness to set you on edge but not scare you away. So to anyone who wants to listen to this, be warned, you might not be the same person at the end, but I still enjoy it. Oh, good for you, John. <laughs> uh, I'm going to need your help with pronunciation here. Okay. This was based on the book by... Da, 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 Leo, back up. How do you say it? This is his name. Von Sacher Mesach. That's just a guess. Oh, because I was going to go with Leo, Leopold von Sacher Mesach. Uh, anyone who speaks German, please correct us in the comments, please, and thank you. Okay. Now, basically, Lou, Lou serves up the Cliff Notes or the Spark Notes version of, of the, the book. book. Effectively. Mm -hmm. Which I did read. It's a short book. Came out in 1870. Mm -hmm. And... My eyebrows were raised. I'm thinking, wow, people were just as... Oh, yeah, people have always been into freaky stuff since the dawn of time. Since, I, I guess so. Yeah. And this led me to, let's see, on Wikipedia, this led me to a page about something called the... Oh, shoot. I don't know. It was the Fulton Street in San Francisco. They have a... Um, they have a annual street fair in September celebrating this sort of thing. I'm like... Wow, huh, that's, good for them. that's very San Francisco of them. Mm. Anyway, John Cale makes with the viola drone throughout the song, and it's the perfect complement to the subject matter. Mm -hmm. It kind of gives it... Uh, the searingness of the whip? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it does. It does. And once again, despite the subject matter and the droning, the Velvets come up with a catchy song. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, I, I want to go back to, I'm waiting for the man I forgot to say when you mentioned uh, Bowie, mm -hmm. that he actually recorded a version of this, of I'm Waiting for the Man. Really? Before the Velvet's version of I'm Waiting for the Man. Because it took so friggin' long. <laughs> yeah, yep, and he had got an advanced copy. Anyway, sorry about that. And back, back to the to album. This. Run, run, run. Run, the, run, run? Run, run, run. The Bob Dylan influence is strong with yes. this one. Yes, yes. For the vocals, for not being able to understand the meaning right away, and of course, for the drugs. If Bob did a cover of this, I would love to hear it. With a quick Google search, you learn the story of teenage Mary who was trying to kick drugs, and the song explains quitting isn't easy, especially when we hear about the desperate lengths people go to and when there's a fatal overdose. Yet I wonder how many people missed the point of this song and played it while high or maybe played it to get numb. I will say the guitar is incredible here, but that one long screech is harsh on headphones, especially when it's right up against my right ear. I was like, ow, I gotta turn my volume down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is like Dylan gone wrong. Or oh, right? Maybe right. Uh, yeah. Since Tom Wilson also produced Bob, the similarity shouldn't be surprising. And to me, Lou sounds like like a smartass Bob in this song. Yeah. As he chronicles teenage Mary. Bob. Yep. <laughs> chronicles teenage Mary, Margarita Passion, Seasick Sarah, and Beardless Harry, all out looking to score. And what happens to them after they do? In poor Seasick Sarah's case, she turns blue. Yeah, now, the she did. The playing is primal, like like it could have come out in the early days of rock and roll. Minus loose stinging solo and the subject matter. Great song, just just great stuff. Yeah. And again, you know, I know they get slagged for like, oh, it's just noise and they don't know what they're doing, but no. They, they do did. know what they're doing. They do know what they're doing. All tomorrow's parties. Hear Excuse me. me, all tomorrow's parties. <laughs> okay, hear me out. Yes. The Velvet Underground's version of Cinderella? Going. A la What Will I Wear to the Ball? Only there's no fairy godmother here. Nico is some ethereal force condemning the poor girl. I can, I can see that. Condemned to forever cry and be the clown. She's the, <laughs> she's the demon godmother. Yeah. Which they kind of did with, like, um, Angela Weber did his version of Cinderella, where the fairy godmother in that is kind of evil and makes Cinderella go through plastic surgery. That, that musical's bad. Don't listen to it. Anyway, man, Lou Reed really liked making, making Nico say the word clown. I... <laughs> Maybe he was like, that's funny. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I broke Dad. Dad has his head on the, on the counter. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Honestly, I think he just wrote that in there just to make her say it. I think this was the song I heard her sing when I was little. And to be fair, I could kind of understand why it freaked me out. So what does the girl uh, end, up, uh, end up wearing? 
Hand me downs in a black shroud. This song is pretty depressing, especially if you're one of those kids in middle school who wanted to fit in and took desperate measures to look good and couldn't stop seeing flaws. So uh, proceed with caution. Now, <laughs> you can't stop thinking about that, can you? Well, I have a few things to say about that. Okay. Uh, Lou Reed wrote this about Andy Warhol's clique, just hanging back and watching Andy watch everybody. Uh -huh. And of course, you know, it turned out to be Andy's favorite Velvet Underground song because it was about him. Mm -hmm. And it's been covered a lot, but this is the version to be, even with Nico's vocals. They just nail the whole boredom or ennui, ennui. of the scene. Ennui. Well, yeah. Okay, she's European, so I'll go with ennui. Mm -hmm. um, once again, great arrangement and great playing by the band. And <clears throat> to me, Lou's playing is almost birds-like. It kind of reminds me of their song, Eight Miles High. And like at the end, the song just ends abruptly with no fade out. And now the weird thing, but this may sound weird, but the thing I love most about this song mm -hmm. and Femme Fatale, and you just mentioned it, is Nico's pronunciation of the word clown. clown. Now call me immature, but it cracks me up every time she says that word. I don't know why, it, why, but it just does. It just brings a smile on my face and I am just... Well, I'm gonna do some Googling. How do on you the floor. say clown in German? Okay, we're buffering here. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's so it's clown and you have der clown, der Hanswurst, and another word, der Possenreiber. So there's three words for it, and it's spelled the same way. Maybe not that's with, just the German pronunciation. Not with then. a K? No, not with a K. K would have been very German. Yeah, it would have been. Anyway, so this is the end of side one. Now side two. Heroin. The opening has a very similar sound to Venus and Furs, but this time with a melancholy mood. In my opinion, this is, this is the best written song on the album. Didn't say it was my favorite, but best written. First, the increases in tempo to capture the rush of a high from injection, and it gets more and more chaotic as the song progresses. Second, with Lou Reed's lyrics, you can tell that he's not at peace with heroin, but loves the rush and needs the escape. If a drug addiction manifested itself into a song, this would be it, because we can hear the chaos of the outside world and the chaos of his brain as he just accepts this is the way his addiction is and this is the way his life is. If this song doesn't make you sit and think, then you really need to listen to it again. Mm -hmm. Now, Lou said he wrote this back in his songwriter days. Allegedly, he was locked in a room and told to write 10 surfing songs. This came out and said, and the reaction was, no, 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 this is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Nope. Now, there's no bass in this song. Hmm. And at one point, a little after the five-minute mark, Maureen Tucker stopped drumming because she said the band was playing so loudly she couldn't hear anything. She assumed they'd stop too, but nope. They kept going, and so she came. She comes back in after about 15 seconds, and it happens again a little later in the song. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Lou, to me, this is Lou's statement of purpose song. When the smack begins to flow, he doesn't care about anything else mm -hmm. at all all. Mm -hmm. Heroin's his wife, his life, the death of him. Nope, but close. Yeah. Um, he feels like Jesus' son. But, but, here's the thing. Uh -huh. Lou and the rest of the band were not advocating drug use. Hmm. They're hmm. cut. Well, that's... This was, he said this was meant to be an objective description yeah. without taking a moral stance. And the thing was, at concerts, Fans would come up to the band and say they had just shot up to heroin. And this disturbed Lou to the point of hesitancy. He doesn't hesitancy. perform it anymore? Well, well, he didn't perform it anymore? That well, I should say. he was hesitant to play it, the song, throughout much of the band's career, which wasn't a long career, but I guess eventually he would. I mean, he did play it um, during his solo career. If you pick up his uh, live album, Rock and Roll Animal, which... I ended up downloading. He he does play it. That's always the danger of making art about serious topics because you can't control <clears throat> how the fans are going to interpret it no matter what your message was going into it. Yep. It's kind of like almost reminds me of Death of the Author in a way where once something is made, then the fans make it their own and it's like the creator doesn't exist anymore. I can mm -hmm. see that kind of happening with this song. And yet again, the band comes up with a beautiful arrangement for the most part until the drug hits and then they get faster and louder for the last two minutes of the song. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now... Billy Idol covered this song as only he can, and I listen to it, and it's pretty bad. It misses the whole point of what Lou was trying to do. Yeah. But I'm sure Lou still cashed those royalty checks. Oh, yeah, he can't complain with that. Yeah. Laughing all the way to the bank. 
There she goes again. This isn't the happy bubbly pop song, so don't get your hopes up. No, this isn't Marshall Crenshaw. There she goes again. No. No. <laughs> for, for a brief minute, I hoped. Alas. Anyway, a girl is walking down the street, and she's not taking crap for her man anymore or from anyone else. Lou tells his friend, you better hit her as a way to stop her and to cope with his anger at success, which, oof. Now I can hear the drums representing the blows raining down. So if Lou suggests to hit, all right, I tell her to hit back with everything you got. Cripple him where it counts until he's clutching his crotch and sobbing for mommy and then walk away in your high heels. Aha. That's after, what I have to say. After he kissed those high heels. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think this could have been a hit in an alternative, alternative universe. Mm -hmm. The background, the background vocals kind of seem tongue in cheek to me, like they can't believe they're singing this cheesy stuff. Anyway, this is this is cheesy though for the Velvet Underground. Keep in mind. Mm. Anyway, originally I thought like my guess is she's out on the street looking to score, getting down on her knees to uh, provide a service for it. But then when you said about the hitting, like like it says she won't take it from just any guy except. I was thinking, well, maybe the guy who has her fix. But when you brought up, you know. When Lou says about, you know, maybe she needs to be here, I thought, oh my god, maybe it's a prostitute pimp kind of relationship thing going oh, on. Oof. Which oh, I could see that is a possibility. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Next track, I'll Be Your Mirror. I almost like this song. I came so close. What happened? Okay, let's go into it. So what I want to know is, has anyone used these lyrics in their wedding vows? Because I think it would be kind of perfect. Huh. You could have done that. Well, you didn't listen to the Velvet Underground at the time. Anyway, uh, but I don't think Nico's voice is right for this particular track. That's why I didn't like it. I mean, it's a Velvet Underground album, so it's not going to be sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. But a contralto is not right for the subject matter of this song. I know there are probably some covers out there, so I can find one with the loving tone I'm looking for. But I do have to say those backing vocals are beautiful in contrast with her voice. We just need that sound more consistently throughout the song, and then it would have been perfect. I came so close. And it's so frustrating when I do the show, and I hear a song that I almost like, and I don't like it. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, Lou Reed wrote this song for Nico after she came up to him after a show and said, Oh, Lou, I'll be your mirror. Okay. Sterling Morrison said the toughest thing was to get Nico to sing the song gently. Because of her, Cause of her, her voice. voice, yeah. And she sang it over and over and over and then broke down and burst into tears and the yeah. rest of the band thought, just one more time and if it doesn't work, we won't do it. And then of course, Nico just nailed it just like the band wanted all along. Mm -hmm. So I guess they had to break her down. Oh, that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, anyway, lyrically, it's a love song, but vocally, I'm with you. I, I listen to it and I think Nico is struggling with it. Um... Not quite getting the song's essence. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, I have another version of this on vinyl. By? By Susanna Hoffs from the Bangles. How's it sound? And it was on a compilation called Rainy Day. And it's from the early 80s. And it's a little too cute vocally. Oh. And I figure, like you, there's got to be a happy medium somewhere between yeah. Susanna and Nico. I'm sure there's a bajillion covers of this song out there by a bajillion Chantuses. Please send us one. And one of them must have gotten it right. Yep. Maybe if we put this on the internet, we'll see. The Black Angels' Death Song. After listening to this album, I never want to hear Brett and Eddie from Two Set Violin talk shit about the viola and viola players ever again. Because I've heard what can be done with it from Venus and Furs to this. Since Lou Reed himself admitted there's no particular meaning to this song, I'll skip the analysis. But I will say, I can picture this piece being bastardized by people trying to find meaning or using it in some edgy theater piece that thinks it's holding up a mirror to reality a la Bertolt Brecht, but it's not. It's just bullshit. So, mm -hmm. Dad, thoughts? Yep. Yep. Uh, Lou, wrote the, Lou wrote that the idea of this song was just to string words together for the sheer fun of their song. No particular meaning. Mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. Very beat Nick Daddy O. <laughs> anyway. Very da is it would you say it was Dada in a way? Or no? I guess yeah, I guess it could be. Okay. Yeah. Because I know da Dada was more uh, more mocking in a way with some of some Or of it, it could be like I mean William Burroughs was doing something different similar when he was writing back then, the in the beat generation type thing of just like, you know, Writing these things, cutting up the words and the sentences, stringing them together, and see what you get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Words for the sake of words. Yeah. But for the sake of this sound. Word salad. Yep. Sound salad. Uh, the band played this during what was to be his two-week stint at the Café Bazaar in Greenwich Village. Mm. The, man the manager of the café heard it, ordered them not to play it again. They played it again, and they got fired. <laughs> so John Cale makes with the skirling droning viola and the hissing on the mic. And the first time That's I... That's what it was. Okay. The first time I heard this, I thought, oh, shit, something's wrong with the CD. That's what I thought. I thought, uh, do they want to check the microphone? I think they need to do a sound check again. Well, I, I didn't think it was the recording so much as, oh, God, something's wrong with the CD. It's a library copy, so is something's wrong with it. So, yeah, Kale, you magnificent bastard, you got me. You, you happy now? You got me. <laughs> That's exactly what he wanted. He wanted to target you specifically and make you panic about your library CD. Because I, I, remember, I remember the moment it came on, I thought, let me play this again. And like, okay, it's on. Okay, it stopped. Okay, it's coming on again. Okay. Oh, it's part of the song. Okay. Mm. All right. All right. I get it. Yeah. Final track. European Sun. Okay. We have an instrumental with some lyrics at the beginning, Ooh, uh, but then there's a roar from a tiger or a lion and then some glass shatters, which I thought, huh, that's pretty cool. That's John Cale. But then the rest of the song descends into chaos, as is the way of the universe. If you can last through these seven minutes, then my hat's off to you. But I will say, I do think this song would be great in an epic chase sequence. That'd be pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Lou dedicated this song to the poet Delmar Schwartz. He was Lou's literary mentor at Syracuse University. I read that, yeah. Lou chose this song because it had the fewest words, as Schwartz hated rock and roll lyrics. So Schwartz got his. <laughs> uh, musically, it sounds it starts off like a Chuck Berry song. Oh, great. And then at the one minute mark, things get crazy. Mm -hmm. The Chuck riff is still there at first, but stuff's crashing, and then it's six minutes of improv. And I think it works the band managed to actually play together mm -hmm. loudly and sometimes dis dissonantly, mm -hmm. dissonantly, mm -hmm. but together. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like jazz where it's like, okay, here's the basic structure and let's just run with it. Mm -hmm. And that is the album. Overall, if the Velvet Underground resonates with you, great. If it doesn't read with you, resonate with you, then that's okay too. Rock in the Vein of the Velvet Underground is a very particular taste. Some songs will appeal to the masses, some won't. And if you're part of the core audience of fans who can listen to this whole album, then my hat's off to you. I'm glad I listened to it because it gave me some things to think about and some stories to tell. But in terms of what music I'll add to my playlist, I will be very particular about what I add and what I withhold. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And this was a long album for its time, 49 minutes, when the average LP was 35 to 40 minutes long. Oh, wow. So people... Depending, depending on their outlook, they either got their money's worth or they got extended misery. <laughs> What'd you get? Um, I got my money's worth. Okay, cool. Yep. Right. Yep. I got um, extended misery, I think. <laughs> so, if you do check out this album and like it, listen to the others, but listen to them in chronological order. Like the next, the second one is White Light, White Heat, which kind of takes European sun and just runs down the football field with it, mm. um, with the sound. But the thing is, it's like the change from abrasive to tuneful is a is like it's a shock. It's impressive how they do it. Yeah, yeah. Like going from white light, white heat to the third album, the Velvet Underground, and then to Loaded. You just can't believe it's the same band. Mm. Um, great albums, great band. Um, highly recommended. Like like I said, I mean, it took me a long time to come around to this stuff, but when I did, it really hit. It might be the same for you. You might listen to this and think, oh my god. This is terrible. Or you might think, wow, I get it. This is this is really great. So do have some it, fun out there. Do with that what you will. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Follow me on social media if you want the episodes there. And if you are friends with my dad, you can email him and he will send the episodes right to your inbox. Dad, thank you uh, for uh, coming uh, back to the podcast. Uh, as always, I'm very happy that we keep doing this every two weeks <laughs> and that we don't call it quits. <laughs> Well, we're going to keep doing it until, I was going to say until our audience asks us to stop, but if they do ask us to stop, no, we're just going to keep going. No, we'll keep going. As always, thank you for listening to the latest album and my dad listens to this. We'll be back next time with another album to pick a grape about dad. Anything you want to say before we sign off? Nope. Okay. Uh, bye, everyone. Uh, go eat a banana. They have a lot of potassium. Bye.